Thank you. With regard to 5G and the potential for dirty networks, has the U.S. begun development of 6G? And is it plausible to skip 5G and go straight to 6G? And if not, what is the option? Uh, with regard to 6G, I mean, I've seen it bandied about. Um, you know, it sort of feels like you can keep taking the 7G, 8G. Um, I, I personally think the, the focus right now needs to be on 5G. Um, I'm not sure the technical limitations of getting to 6. Um, I think we've got enough of a competition on our hands right now in making sure that we get 5G right. Um, I just add one thought to that, stepping out of my moderator's role. There's a temptation to think that 5G is just another acceleration of speed the way 3 and 4G was? It's not. It's actually not about us and our cell phones. It's actually about the Internet of Things talking to the Internet of Things, right? It's machines talking to machines, going up, getting information from the cloud and down, your autonomous car, a factory, so forth. We all think of it in terms of our cell phones because we're walking around with them every day. That's an interesting peripheral addition to what this is all about. I wanted to start with something that is considered a security threat, but not necessarily the number one military technological threat before we go into the, the military themselves. And that is the race over 5G. Because if you listen to um, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, on some weeks the President uh, this is the major security challenge with China facing the U.S. And as everyone in this room knows, the United States has moved quite aggressively really since the last security forum uh, uh, was over last uh, July to bar Huawei and other Chinese makers from the U.S. market and then to go around to each one of the major American allies and say, if you sign up to this Chinese technology, you may be cut out of American intelligence, cooperation. We may not be able to base American troops. In fact, um, Secretary of State Pompeo openly threatened the polls that they would not get what they call Fort Trump, uh, but uh, basically a, a US uh, presence in Poland if they signed on with Huawei because he couldn't guarantee that the communications over that network would be secure. So first question for you, Chris. Is this even the right argument? Do we have the right dystopian view here that if the Chinese are even in our day-to-day -day commercial networks, which the military uses some, but not exclusively, that we uh, basically have lost the race before it begins? Thank you. Um, so let me make two points on this. Uh, I, I do think it's important, and I do think it's something that needs to be prioritized. I guess the point that I would make is that uh, the United States and China are running different 5G races. And if you allow me to get a little bit technical, um, China's building out, or the United States is building out 5G in a band of spectrum that's called millimeter wave. It's a higher band of spectrum. Uh, we're doing that because the Department of Defense operates in a lower band, which is called sub-6. And that's where China is building out its spectrum, uh, or its 5G. So we're essentially building different kinds of 5G networks. Um, when you look at it, I think there's some inherent advantages to the way China's going about it. And you get essentially uh, the, the greater range over which you can transmit information, and there are fewer obstacles to the carry of that signal in terms of buildings or people or weather disrupting that. Um, I think this is significant because in building out these communications networks, there's an inherent first mover advantage. And the United States had that in 4G. Um, China, I think, has that in 5G. And if they're able to consolidate a larger share of the market, um, they're going to not only take uh, you know, the, the, the market for 5G, but then all of the things that are going to be built on top of that. Uh, so the infrastructure, the kinds of devices that uh, are going to be 5G enabled, uh, the kinds of applications and services that are then built on top of it, all the things the United States was able to do in 4G by virtue of having that prime mover advantage. Now, I think the implications for the Department of Defense are significant in that respect. Um, in the United States military operating overseas, uh, it just raises the prospect that they're going to be operating inside of potentially dirty networks, uh, that they're going to have large parts of their global supply chain uh, potentially compromised by dirty networks. 
So I do think the administration is right to be concerned about this. I mean, the, the point that I'd end on just very briefly, and I think we'll get back to it later, is when it comes to really thinking differently about how we build military systems and how we build uh, military networks, battle networks, um, I'm not sure 5G is the most important technology that's out there for reimagining how the United States military needs to operate in the future, but we can come back to that. So it, what you're saying to us is it may be absolutely critical for the, for the um, civilian infrastructure, for supply chain, for development of next generation AI uh, and so forth, but it may not be the most critical technology when you're talking about weapon systems. In terms of how you actually build and operate militaries, uh, I don't think that 5G is going to be the most important technology that's out there. Um, but I do think it's going to have significant implications for uh, how the United States military might be operating overseas in a world where China has essentially consolidated much of the global 5G market, built the infrastructure, built the software applications and services uh, that, that that infrastructure enables. So General Thomas, as you were running Special Operations Command, um, Having a um, clear, uncor uncorrupted communications network was pretty high up on your uh, priority list. Uh, you've heard the description that Chris is, has given. Um, how would you place this 5G um, race in with the broader military technological race? Uh, I think it's part of the what well, needs to be an integrated approach. Uh, to make make sure we maintain comp or some uh, level of competitiveness that that is superior to our adversary, um, you mentioned that we've had the luxury of operating in, in pretty untrammeled spaces for the last 18 years. Although, and I mentioned it when I was here last year, uh, we had just had our first uh, reacquaintance with electronic warfare and things like that, courtesy of the Russians in Syria. Um, this is an area that um, we have lacked uh, competition in terms of pure competition. And we've lacked an adversary that's really pushed us to the, to, uh, to the necessary levels of competence. So I, I think it is uh, it, uh, certainly part of the integrated approach that we, have to, that we have to pursue going forward. And how does it, as you rank the technologies that we need to make sure that we stay on top of with the Chinese to the broader theme of this panel, where would you put 5G in comparison to the other ones that, that uh, we'll all be discussing? AI, uh, quantum computing, everything that Nick named in the course of uh, his introduction there. I, I don't know that you can accept risk. You, you can accept risk, um, but to your, to your detriment, if you don't want to compete in all those correlated spaces. 5G, is, as I uh, would value it, enables artificial intelligence, which I think is the transformative and maybe revolutionary wave that we are riding right now, and certainly with which the Chinese are pursuing. So it, to me, it's all interrelated, and I don't think you want to put markers down on, on uh, you, know, uh, you know, less than substantial bets in the future that, that are going to play out. One of the differences with the space race of 50 years ago that we're celebrating today is that we were then designing a um, space project that clearly was closely related to our missile program. And our thought was that the military advances and the space advances we made would then spill over to commercial technology. We are now in the world of the reverse, and the Chinese have embraced that more than anyone else has, which is that we're all about the commercial technology feeding the military application, which is what Mike Brown's doing at DIUX and, and, uh, and many others are uh, as well. And that's a very different kind of way to think about it because we've been living in the assumption that the natural forces that we have in Silicon Valley and elsewhere will stumble to us being in the lead because it worked with Google and it worked with um, uh, Microsoft Windows and it has worked with mobile computing. And the Chinese are going about it in a very organized way, much the way the Japanese tried to go at it in an organized way 30 years ago. And we're assuming somehow that they're not going to get there the way the, the uh, Japanese sort of overplanned for this. I'm not sure that's the right assumption.